Download Upside and start getting cash back wherever you roll. It's like having your own hype man. Get an average of 17% cash back at restaurants. Oh, it's dinner time. Average of 13% on groceries. Get those groceries. 10 cents per gallon average cash back on gas. It's go time. Plus, cash back at participating convenience stores too. Stacks on stacks. Users can earn hundreds of dollars a year, three times more than other apps. Upside, show me that money. All right, we get it. Get it. It's easy. Just sign up for the free Upside app and start getting cash back for doing you. Download the free Upside app and use promo code DOYOU10 for an extra $10 cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's promo code DOYOU10 for an extra $10 on the free Upside app. Get cash back for doing you with the free app from Upside. Welcome to episode 185 of Real Life Ghost Stories. And to kick things off this week, I would like to say thank you to some of our newest Patreon subscribers. I would like to thank Jade Van Atta, Dave Morris, Gabrielle Hollanders, Ashley Lloyd, Jay Honan, Francisco Reese, Mel 63254, Anna Graham, Joseph, Leslie Craig, Nancy Mayer, Christy Deemer, Matt Osborne, Rachel Prisgoda, Bethany Mayer, Kelly Knight, Katie Trott, Steph Mellowish, Amy Clausen, and Terry and Amy. Thank you so much for subscribing to the Patreon. I love you and appreciate you every single day. And our film review this week, our film review is Ready or Not. Ready or Not was released in 2019. It has 6.8 out of 10 on IMDb and 88% on Rotten Tomatoes. Grace couldn't be happier after she marries the man of her dreams at his family's luxurious estate. There's just one catch. She must now hide from midnight until dawn while her new in-laws hunt her down with guns, crossbows and other weapons. As Grace desperately tries to survive the night, she soon finds a way to turn the tables on her not-so-lovable relatives. So I kind of wasn't really that into watching this film for a really long time, because it's not my vibe. These kind of really violent, hunting the protagonist kind of films just aren't really my thing. That's just personal taste. So I had a movie night this week and this was the film that we chose to watch. So I watched it with a group of friends. And you know what? In terms of the likes column, it was a cool take on the final girl archetype, right? I like to see a girl kick an ass. I like to see a girl being able to kick the shit out of some people that I didn't like on the screen, you know? And what I liked about this film in terms of the final girl is that we didn't really get to know that much of her backstory. It was basically just, we came in at the point where she's marrying the man of her dreams and then she marries into his really fucked up family and she's really mad about it. And I liked that. I'd be pretty annoyed too. Although I do think that in in the very beginning when I realised what was going on, I would immediately give up and just be like, oh, just kill me now because I'm not running around and getting injured for anybody. No way. I really enjoyed the excess of it. Like I loved the setting of it because it's set in obviously this big family mansion, stately home and everybody's really, really rich. And I kind of, in a way, I love films that centre around the lives of rich people basically because I'm just super nosy and I and I like to sort of look at how the other half live. And this family are like rich, rich dynasty family and their house is just crazy And I really thought that they did well to give each of the family members a really distinct personality. So on the night of the wedding, the members of his immediate family and her sit down as is tradition to play this game. So it's her on her own against all the members of his family. And the result of the game, obviously, is that she ends up being hunted. Now, that's not giving anything away because you know that from the trailer. And I thought that the writers did a really good job of giving each of the family members a distinct personality. They weren't just general rich people all of the time. I mean, they were a lot of the time, but they all had distinct reasons to both dislike and like them. 
And a lot of the time I just couldn't help but enjoy watching the really rich family floundering over trying to kill this girl. There was bits of it that were genuinely really funny. Like really, really funny. And I appreciate that the film was trying to be a social commentary at times on these really, really uber rich families. And for example, how they treat people who they perceive to be a lower class than them and how they treat people who they perceive to be the help. And I'm putting the help in inverted commas. There are great moments of satire with the help in this movie that are, they, they, they hammer the point home, let's just say. So like I said, the film was genuinely funny and I, for one, and I probably am in the minority here, I loved the ending. I always feel like if you're going to do a film that has a ridiculous premise, just lean into it. Just, just absolutely lean into it. Have a crazy premise for a film. Have a good time with it. If you're going to make a film that's a social commentary, it's a bit of a satire. It's a bit ridiculous. It's okay to make the ending ridiculous too. And this film, I just, I just thought, you know what, you went for it. You did it well. I appreciate that. And I thought as final girls go, she was pretty kick-ass and funny and ballsy and I really enjoyed that. And on to dislikes. I just, it's just not my thing. I'm not mad about these kinds of films, these sort of slasher and survival things. And when I say I'm not mad about them, I mean being mad about them in the like really enjoying them sense, not like angry. I just, I get to a point where I get tired of the violence. I'm like, okay, how many more times can we see somebody getting hurt? And it's just not, it's not really my thing. Um, and I and I have to say this because it annoys me in films. I love watching the lives of rich people, right? But it does kind of make me raise my eyebrows when Hollywood makes films critiquing the super rich. Like the irony is not lost on me. I watch them and I'm like, you're critiquing the super rich and Hollywood is famously incredibly rich. And granted, this film, I think, did it well. Like it was genuinely funny. It's just not really my vibe as a film. And I know that's bad reviewing to say that something just isn't my vibe. But that is what it is. But to me, overall, it was funny, it was silly. There was lots of good final girl action to get behind. And you're really rooting for her, like genuinely rooting for her. You're trying to find the good in the kind of bad guys and putting bad guys in inverted commas. And I loved the ending. It is a film to enjoy with a group of friends. I'm glad I watched it with people because we were able to talk about it and laugh about it and discuss what we think was going to happen while we were watching it. So group of friends, round Halloween time, definitely this is a good film to watch. I'm going to give it four stars. It's not really my cup of tea, but I can see the appeal in it. And as films of its type go, I think it's a pretty good one. So that's four stars for Ready or Not. Download Upside and start getting cash back wherever you roll. It's like having your own hype man. Get an average of 17% cash back at restaurants. Oh, it's dinner time. Average of 13% on groceries. Get those groceries. 10 cents per gallon average cash back on gas. It's go time. Plus, cash back at participating convenience stores too. Stacks on stacks. Users can earn hundreds of dollars a year, three times more than other apps. Upside, show me that money. All right, we get it. Get it. It's easy. Just sign up for the free Upside app and start getting cash back for doing you. Download the free Upside app and use promo code DOYOU10 for an extra $10 cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's promo code DOYOU10 for an extra $10 on the free Upside app. Get cash back for doing you with the free app from Upside. And as you know, this is part two of the Union Screaming House story. I did not realise when I started this research that this would be a two-parter. I did not. I got the book. Uh, Somebody recommended it. If you are the person who recommended it, thank you. I appreciate you because you recommended it. And then I wrote it down and I didn't write down your name. So thank you. And I started reading it and I realised very quickly, oh, there's a lot going on here. If you want to have like the shortened version of this, I have left the link to where you can watch the uh, Discovery Channel's A Haunting episode that is based on this story. It's a good watch. It's worth a watch. It kind of gives you an abridged version of the story. Let's do a really quick recap of part one. So Stephen Lachance moves into a house in Union 
with his three children. His wife has left them, or as he repeatedly says in the book, his wife abandoned him with the children. And he is living there with three children, just trying to make things work, trying to figure out their new life. His sister has just died. So there's a lot going on. They move into the house. There's lots of banging. There is lots of things being moved around. Lots of terrible nightmares. One of the children claims to see like a shadow person, an entity chasing him up the stairs. Stephen thinks it's not real. Things get really bad. They hear a man screaming in the house in pain. They think... They see a shadow entity moving through the house and eventually they end up leaving and Stephen swears that he is never going back. So let's get straight into part two. He was never going back. That was it. He had secured a new home, a place that was new and without a history. There would be no anguished screaming, no thumps and bangs and no more nightmares. Well, sort of. The meeting with the landlord had been fraught. Stephen had laid out the issues and Mr Winters had simply said that some people weren't equipped to live in an old house. Not equipped? How could anyone have been equipped to live in an environment like that? How could anyone raise children in a house like that? Luckily for Stephen, Mr Winters had a cousin who was keen to move in so the transfer of the lease would be relatively straightforward. Stephen implored him, begged him to make sure that no children moved into the house to which Mr Winters agreed. And while Stephen had vowed never to go back to the house, there were adult practicalities such as moving out all the family's items that had to be taken into consideration. The family had moved in with Stephen's parents for the time being and he had made frequent trips back to the house but only to collect the mail where he would leave the car engine running and sprint to the mailbox and back again. The day of the move was tricky. Stephen and his father had no choice but to enter the house and were met with booms and thuds from up the stairs which naturally unnerved them both. But what unnerved Stephen more was the new family that parked their car on the curbside. A man, a woman and two small children. Stephen had thought the ordeal was over, but months later he was plagued with nightmares still. No matter what he tried, he just couldn't get a good night's sleep without the black tendrils of the house worming their way into his brain. He became genuinely afraid of the night time and afraid of the dark. When he tried to sleep, he slept with the lights on. The days became long and hazy as the lack of sleep took hold. Stephen had every test he could, MRIs, ECGs, CT scans, you name it, and eventually he was subject to a sleep study in order to see if his lack of sleep was physiological. He was diagnosed with sleep apnea, And in a way, he was relieved. There was a reason for his lack of sleep, and it wasn't the house. It was something medical, and something that could be fixed. Oh, thank God, he told the doctor. So does that explain the nightmares? Nightmares? The doctor looked at him in confusion. You shouldn't be having nightmares, Mr. Lachance. You never fall asleep to the point where dreams can happen. Whatever they were, whether they were dreams or visions or nightmares, they continued. Dreams of the man in the butcher's shower frantically trying to clean the blood from his body. Dreams of a man standing outside the window and when Stephen would look again he would be closer and closer until eventually it was just a man standing outside the window with a huge grin that was too wide. Eyes that were black and dead and teeth that were too pointed. One nightmare tipped him over the edge completely. When this man with a dead frozen smile smashed in the window and climbed right in. Stephen was found by his daughter Lydia. Huddled and cowering in the corner crying. He realised that something was very wrong when his teenage daughter was soothing him from his nightmares. He had to do something and he decided that the first and only thing he could think to do was to write down his story. 
and so he sat down at his computer and he wrote. The words spilled out of his fingertips and page after page filled up and when he was finished, Stephen made the split-second decision to publish his story on a few select places on the internet and he went to bed. Obviously writing the story down on paper did something to exercise the demons that Stephen was facing in his brain, as that night he slept soundly. In the morning he was feeling unusually refreshed as he sat down to check his emails. Coffee in hand he opened his inbox and was shocked to see that there were hundreds of emails. Hundreds. It didn't even occur to him that it could be to do with the story he had published about the Union House. Until he began opening the emails. Testimony after testimony from people who believed his story. People who had had similar experiences. People who knew what happened when the darkness invaded your life. There was one email that caught his eye. It was from a woman called Sheila. Sheila had read his story was an amateur photographer and was intrigued by the Union House. She wondered if Stephen would be interested in having a chat about the house and maybe meeting her outside the house so that Stephen could take pictures. The email made Stephen think. It had been some time since he had moved out and he had heard that the landlord, Mr Winters, had turned the house into dog kennels so really what harm could it do? He wouldn't be stepping foot inside the house and no one lived there now, so it would be all fine. Right? Stephen was still mulling it over when the phone rang a few days later. It was Sheila on the other end of the phone. Stephen, I went to the house. Stephen, it's not a dog kennel. I went to the house and there was a woman on the lawn and she said she was living there right now. I told her about your account of what happened to you and she wants to talk to you. There was a pause. Stephen, there are children living in the house. Helen's life had been turbulent, and the house at Union was a fresh start where her extended family could live in harmony. She and her partner Charlie had moved in, along with their teenage daughter Kelly. Helen's adult daughter Patty moved in, and Charlie's adult son, who was struggling with a serious drug addiction, When she had toured the house, she thought Mr Winters was a very strange man. He had led the tour as though they were moving through a museum, treating the house with an almost fearful reverence. Every noise made him jump, and he refused to be there after dark. The dark and oppressive atmosphere of the house made itself known almost immediately. Patty only lived in the house a short time as she was simply too terrified, and Charlie left soon afterwards. Sadly, he died in the following months. Helen, Charlie, their daughter Kelly and their grandson lived in the house. Helen would hear heavy breathing in the house wherever she was, always close by her, and she could never find a source. She would hear footsteps upstairs when she was downstairs. Odd things began happening, like all of the hair was cut off Kelly's dolls, which she vehemently denied, and no one seemed to have any knowledge of it. In a disturbing and sickening turn of events, their new kitten was found dead in a locked room with its neck and spine broken. The gutters of the house regularly caught fire with no explanation, the transformer blew all the time. Helen was replacing light bulbs almost daily. Items moved around seemingly by themselves, disappearing and reappearing. One day while Helen was pottering around the house, the police arrived at the door. They had received a call from inside the house to say that someone was going to die by suicide. Helen hadn't made any calls and was completely dumbfounded by what was happening. There was whispering constantly, and no matter how often she checked, the lights were always on when she returned home. She found her grandson at the bottom of the stairs, badly bruised and crying, claiming that the bad man had pushed him down the stairs. Helen always felt that something was watching her from the top window of the house. As Stephen listened to Helen's voice on the other end of the phone, he felt a surge of relief. He wasn't crazy. This was not just in his and his children's imagination. This had actually happened to them. And now it was happening to Helen too. 
Together they decided that the first thing that they needed to do was to do some digging about the history of the house. There would have to be something in its past that would explain what was happening there. But even searching for information was proving to be difficult. When Stephen would explain to librarians and archivists in the town what he was looking for, he felt as though he was being blocked at every turn. He felt like they were almost one step ahead of him, removing the information from his grasp, almost like there was a conspiracy of silence around the house. What he found out did not help explain the activity in the Union House, but it was interesting nonetheless. The house had been built in 1936, but prior to this, the land had been owned by Captain John T. Cromwell. He had built a slave house right on the spot where the Union House now stood. There was also rumours for many years that he had built tunnels from his house to the slave house all the way to the railroad, which was believed to have been used for the transport of slaves. This part of the story actually turned out to be true, when in later years roadworks tapped into the tunnels accidentally. There were rumours among the older residents of the town that Captain Cromwell had been in cahoots with the devil and that he had dabbled in black magic. There were rumours that he had murdered native people who lived on the land and rumours that he had helped provide dangerous abortions for sex workers and slaves. The house across the road was known locally as the Murder House, where a woman had killed her husband and then killed herself. In the house a few doors down, a man had shot himself in front of a small child. The nursing home at the top of the hill, where Helen's partner Charlie worked, had previously been a Civil War infirmary and the whole area was awash with unmarked graves due to multiple TB outbreaks. And while the stories were tragic, they didn't really explain what was happening in the house. And all the while, Helen was still living there. Her life seemed to be completely plagued by bad luck and Stephen's nightmares continued all the while his life was also plagued by bad luck. It felt like the darkness of the Union Screaming House had gotten its claws in and was intent on destroying the lives of both of them. They knew at this point that they needed help, and they needed help fast. The first thing that they decided to do was reach out to a prominent local psychic, and they landed on Betty. Betty was a psychic who ran tours of the local haunted mansion in St. Louis. Helen and Stephen went along to one of her investigations in order to try and get an idea as to whether or not she was a suitable and safe person to invite to the house. Having completed the haunted mansion tour, where approximately nothing paranormal happened whatsoever, they wondered how Betty would fare in an actual haunted house. After explaining to her the situation in the Union House, Betty agreed to do an investigation to Stephen and Helen, this whole situation was completely absurd. How had their lives taken this turn? Suddenly they were inviting psychic mediums into the house to try and understand what was causing the chaos in their lives. When Betty arrived, she was accompanied by her companion, Lee. And before she stepped into the house, she sensed a dark presence. And Stephen and Helen could feel the tension in the air. They could feel the house crackling with anticipation. Betty and Lee made their way upstairs, flanked by Helen and Stephen. As they stood in Kelly's room, that all-too-familiar ball of electricity surged through the air. And as Betty turned to ask Helen a question, she was visibly lifted three inches into the air and thrown against the wall. Stephen? Helen? She said softly after she had regained her composure. I think you should wait downstairs. Stephen and Helen waited for what felt like a lifetime and eventually, Betty and Lee made their way back to the living room. They didn't sit down. You have a man upstairs and he is not happy. There is a portal in the basement where things come and go and if you have the option to leave, then you should leave this house and find somewhere else to live. Thank you for inviting us into your home and I'm sorry we cannot be of more help. And with that, they left. They offered no solution, and Helen seemed to be stuck in this paranormal cycle, and at this point, it was affecting her entire family. Kelly had not been doing well during this period of time. She was terrified of the house and was suffering badly with her mental health in general, but the tipping point came 
when Kelly raced into the house absolutely hysterical. She was crying and barely able to get her words out, but Helen was finally able to understand what she was saying. As Kelly was sitting on the front porch on the phone to her friend, something in the tall tree next to the porch had caught her eye. At first, she thought it was an animal. But as she squinted to try and figure out what it was, she suddenly told her friend that she needed to go and hung up the phone. It was a baby, a human baby hanging by its ankles from the tree in a tiny white gown. She couldn't understand what she was seeing and she slowly inched her way into the house without taking her eyes off it. Helen was petrified for her daughter. Was she on drugs or was she having a psychotic break? Later in the evening, she sat on the steps of the porch with Stephen, tearfully relaying the story to him as a storm rolled in. And as they discussed Helen's worries about Kelly, the sky darkened and the lightning began to flash. As the world descended into shadows, Stephen began to notice something. Every time the lightning flashed, he could see something in the trees. Something hanging there. It was the unmistakable sight of a baby in a white dress. He held his breath and waited for the next bolt of lightning and there it was. Helen? I think we should go inside now. He hadn't realised that Helen was also watching the silhouette of the child in the tree with silent tears streaming down her cheeks. As they sheltered in the living room, the storm began to subside and the crashing of thunder was replaced with the soft pattering of rain. But interspersed with the sound of rain was the sound of something else. Helen and Stephen sat quietly as they could hear the joyful humming and giggling of a child outside the window. In a fit of madness, Stephen stood up and approached the window. It's okay. Come and play in here. We can help you. No sooner had the words left his mouth than the sound of the child playing abruptly stopped and from outside the window came the most inhuman growls Stephen and Helen had ever heard. No one slept that night. It became a regular occurrence for Helen to ring Stephen in a panic and for something increasingly horrific to have happened. One day when Stephen arrived, the sound of the growling was all over the house and Helen rolled up her sleeve to show him a deep bite mark on her arm. It happened when I was sleeping, she said tearfully. I really think it wants to hurt me. Paranormal investigation teams showed up in their droves. Helen was accommodating and welcoming to everyone who came through the door because she was desperate for an answer. Each group had differing stories as to what was happening. Each psychic came up with a different ghost or entity that was allegedly haunting the house. Some came to the house under the influence of drugs and alcohol, but no one actually offered any solutions as to how to help rid the Union House of the entity. Stephen decided that he would put together a team of people from the myriad that they had met in order to try and help Helen and figure out a way to get this thing out of the house. By this point, Helen was never alone, and at least one investigator was with her at all times. Stephen himself ascended the stairs one day and came face to face with a huge black mist. One of the team, a non-believer, physically witnessed a huge hooded red-eyed entity walk out of the fruit cellar in the basement and refused to re-enter the house for some time afterwards. Helen's mother rang her wondering why she had changed her answering machine and when Helen asked her to explain her mother stated that she had called the phone and had heard a woman whispering the Lord's Prayer over and over again before hanging up. Stephen heard a low guttural voice say Jesus as he was standing in the corridor and Helen began to experience feelings of extreme violence and became concerned that she was going to hurt someone. On recommendation, they got a Catholic priest in to bless the house, which did not go well. 
He spent about five minutes in the house, splashed around some holy water, refused to set foot in the basement, instead sprinkling the water on the basement steps, and the loud thumps and bangs had started before the priest had even reached his car. The next morning, Helen realised the pet hamster who was fine the day before was missing. She found only the skull. Picked clean. They decided to do their own blessing, at a complete loss as to what to do, and asked their team to attend in order to ensure that there was somebody stationed in each room of the house, including the basement and in the garden. As the team read a predetermined set of blessings, the temperature in the basement rose to an almost unbearable level, and the air felt electrically charged. But again, nothing changed. And again, after the blessing, Stephen received a phone call from Helen. Stephen, you won't believe this. I was babysitting one of the neighbour kids and she started talking about something being in the room and getting really upset and you won't believe what she said, Stephen. She kept crying about the bad clown, the scary clown. How strange. Stephen had gone cold. His mind went back to when he was living there with his children. Matthew, his son... He had cried about what he called a demon clown and Stephen had dismissed it as his imagination. He obviously thought it was just the pressure of the divorce and the move. But now that he remembered back, Matthew had been so insistent that this clown was real and he was scared out of his wits. The house seemed to have unlimited power to provoke fear into those unlucky enough to live there. The next time Stephen was in the house, he noticed a marked change in Helen, and as they sat discussing the situation as they always did, the living room lit up with a blue-white light from outside. And as they looked out, a huge black wolf was standing on the street watching them. And that was the last week they would spend in that house. I would love to end this story by saying that they discovered the secrets of the house and found someone to do a blessing and they all lived happily ever after. And when I embarked on this story, I was not sure where it would go, but I did not expect it to end here. For the purpose of keeping this respectful, I am reporting the following events and the ending of this story without using the typical narrative voice and you will see why. I have mentioned in this story that Helen had bite marks on her arm and actually the injuries she suffered became much worse than that. According to the narrative of Stephen Lachance, Helen became increasingly aggressive and violent. She would be covered in bite marks all over her arms and her back, and regularly badly bruised. She would threaten to kill the members of her family and Stephen himself. She seemed to have wild personality changes where she became a completely different person. She claimed that she was sexually assaulted by the entity, She believed her partner Charlie was having an affair and subsequently she drove to his work with a large knife and tried to stab him. She then tried to run him over several times. She also showed up to Stephen Lachance's house with a gun. When he did not open the door, she then drove to the union house and sat outside the house with a gun and threatened to take her own life. She was hospitalised for quite a long period of time. In the book, it is reported that she got better through medication, therapy and religious intervention. Both Helen and Stephen Lachance believe that her behaviour was caused by the Union Screaming House. If you need a moment to shake yourself out, now is the time to do so, because there is no happy ending to this story, really. They left the house. The end. But there is no happy ending. Uh, I had to go and eat loads of, like I like a family-sized bag of mini-eggs. I have, I say I had to, like I didn't have to, but you know, it made me feel considerably better. The end of this book becomes very difficult to read and I felt like it was wrong to, 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 re- to portray it as a big dramatic narrative. If you, if you want to read the full extent of what happened, then by all means read the book, but it is, it's not, it's not an easy read, reading about Helen's sort of I suppose, descent into into that sort of behaviour because it, I found it difficult. I found it difficult to read. I mean, I, I was glad that she found solace through 
therapy and through medication and uh, what they what do they call religious I can't remember what they called it but basically religious meetings with a person from the church is what she had also and if those three things combined worked for her then I'm very very happy for her so I'm going to kind of go back to the beginning of this story which is the haunting that Stephen and his children experience so there are obvious similarities like there is the demonic clown there is obviously the the sort of poltergeist activity that's going on. I think it's important to point out as well that there are two teenage daughters in this household. So there's a teenage daughter who has just been through something really horrific in terms of Lydia where her mother has left and her aunt has just died. And then in the second part of the story, Helen's daughter Kelly has just witnessed her brother die through drug addiction and is having a really hard time and and they talk about her mental health issues in the story she was self-harming she was really struggling she wasn't going to school things were really hard for both teenage girls in this story and often it is it is um theorized by paranormal experts that teenage girls create some sort of energy that brings poltergeist activity into a house and look so many stories that we've covered have dealt with traumatized teenage girls or just teenage girls going through puberty or traumatised women. And I will come back to that point of traumatised women in a little bit. The interesting thing about this is that while there are similarities, like I just said, there are also big differences between these hauntings. There is a huge amount of violence in the haunting that Helen experiences. And as the house is called the Union Screaming House, She doesn't seem to experience or her and her family don't seem to experience the screaming that Stephen Lachance and his family experienced. So as a as a kind of first things first, that would strike me as really interesting. And I I feel like I have to give Stephen Lachance props for all that he did to try and help this woman, because I think that he genuinely wanted to help her I think he genuinely wanted to get to the bottom of what was happening and I actually I do understand why he went back to the house because the experience that he had was clearly so profound and when he realized somebody else was experiencing it I guess there's an element of wanting to know if it was really real wanting to validate yourself and wanting to have a sense of closure that this happened yes but we overcame it so I understand why he went back and I and I appreciate all that he did to try and help her I was so furious the section in the book where he talks about all the different paranormal investigations that took place were honestly so upsetting and so problematic and it made me so cross reading about all these people who marched into this poor woman's house took it over for a night or whatever wrecked the place or you know what I mean not not saying wrecked the place like purposely smashed it up but left a mess after them were really kind of cruel to her there were There were apparently points where paranormal teams came in and just threw around wild accusations and very aggressively accused Helen of doing witchcraft or accused her daughter of doing witchcraft. And, you know, all all of these awful things, they're already going through a hard time. Like you don't need people coming in and being aggressive on top of that. And it really made me cross reading about it because I was like, leave these people alone. And I left out a section as well where one of the team that Stephen had handpicked was actually a, a an addict. I understand that addiction is an illness, so I'm absolutely not trying to um, to vilify anybody with an addiction because that's not what I'm trying to say. But I do feel like the minute somebody starts talking about getting the child from next door and performing a bloodletting ritual on that child is probably the time when you say, I need you to leave the house and not continually give them the benefit of the doubt. So many elements of this story are just wild honestly I can't even believe I just said that sentence about a bloodletting ritual and not allowing that person in your house but I just did and here's the thing this story is terrifying it is scary and it's terrifying I think for two reasons one because there's the haunting element of it which is scary you've got a man screaming you've got the growling you've got you know entities appearing like that's all very scary but the other scary bit of it is that I believe now I know that people some people aren't going to like me saying this but this is just what I believe I believe that there was an element of mental illness going on here that potentially was maybe overlooked for too long 
I said at the beginning of the story that Helen had had a turbulent life, which she had. And I wondered, without delegitimizing her story, because fundamentally, I believe she went through something really traumatic in that house. I really do believe that. And I believe Stephen, the chance, went through something traumatic in that house. I wondered when I was reading this story whether or not Stephen Lachance's story about what happened to him in the Union House previously sort of validated Helen's feelings and therefore gave her a way to kind of explore some of the traumas that she had experienced in her life prior to that. And I don't think that we should ever negate the impact that lack of sleep has on people. And if you are going through something traumatic like a haunted house scenario and uh, uh, incidences where the house is haunted and things in the family aren't going well, I think the fact that Charlie's son died is really briefly mentioned in the book and then never mentioned again. That must have been enormous for the family. It must have been absolutely huge that this this man died of a drug addiction. Like it must have been must have been horrific for the family to have to go through. So you've got that, you've got no sleep, you've got past trauma, you've got this haunted house situation. All of that combined creates an almost impossible situation for anybody to go through. Although I will say, haunted haunted ghost wolf spectres come up an awful lot in the world of the paranormal, don't they? Seem to be always knocking around. All in all, I found this I found this really difficult. I found the second half of this book really difficult. I think you guys know at this point that you know I I think a really distinct line needs to be drawn between ideas around mental health issues and ideas around possession or demonic oppression. I personally find it very difficult. I know there's people listening who believe in demonic oppression and possession and I absolutely 100% respect people's beliefs. But I just I just found the second half of this a very difficult read and I really felt keenly, I felt keenly for this woman. I felt like I just, I just wanted her to be looked after and people, it seemed from this book that people were trying to look after her the best way that they could, the best way that they knew how and I'm glad she got the help and the the treatment that she needed fundamentally at the end of this story. I do, I it did, it was in my brain throughout this story. The link maybe between, so people like the story of Alma Fielding, for example, the story of Virginia Campbell, these women who are surrounded by paranormal happenings who don't really have a voice to talk about this stuff that's going on in their psyche, in their world or traumas that they've experienced. Now, I don't, maybe, maybe Helen was, was freely able to talk about traumas she had experienced and freely able to explore those I don't know but is it is it something to do with voicelessness and finding a voice in all of the paranormal stuff who am I to say thank you so much for listening to today's episode thank you so much for sticking with me for this two-parter and oh what an intense end to that story remember if you've got a story that you'd like to send in please send it to real life ghost stories podcast at gmail.com if you are desperate for extra content you can sign up to patreon that is patreon.com forward slash real life ghost stories where for five dollars a month or two dollars a month you get access to heaps of extra content as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad free and on that note i shall see you next time download upside and start getting cash back wherever you roll it's like having your own hype man get an average of 17 percent cash back at restaurants oh it's dinner time average of 13 percent on groceries get those groceries 10 cents per gallon average cash back on gas it's go time plus Cash back at participating convenience stores, too. Stacks on stacks. Users can earn hundreds of dollars a year, three times more than other apps. Upside, show me that money. All right, we get it. Get it. It's easy. Just sign up for the free Upside app and start getting cash back for doing you. Download the free Upside app and use promo code DOYOU10 for an extra $10 cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's promo code D-O-Y-O-U-1-0 for an extra $10 on the free Upside app. Get cash back for doing you with the free app from Upside.